We're going to start. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session. I think we're going to start. Um, my name is Sam McLeod. I'm uh, the Assistant Deputy Minister and Superintendent of Motor Vehicles for the province of BC. I'm also the uh, British Columbia representative on the CCMTA Board of Directors, and I'm going to be your moderator for this session. Uh, the following presentation is going to last about an hour. Uh, we just ask you to, there will be a question and answer period after that, so we just ask you to hold your questions till the end. And if you do have questions, if you wouldn't mind going to the mics uh, so the translators can hear the questions and, and uh, the rest of the room. Uh, the name of the presentation is uh, Cannabis Motor Vehicle Crashes, What is the Evidence? And to discuss this topic, we have Dr. Jeff Brubaker with us. And Jeff uh, practices as an emergency physician at Vancouver General Hospital, which is BC's biggest trauma center. He's also an associate professor in the University of British Columbia's Department of Emergency Medicine and director of the Emergency Medicine Research Program at the Vancouver Coastal Health Research Institute. Dr. Brubaker's research focuses on road safety with a special interest in impaired driving and traffic policy evaluation. Jeff holds a Scholar Award and a Health Professional Investigator Award from the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research. Uh, he chairs the British Columbia Road Safety Strategy uh, Research and Data Committee. He sits on the City of Vancouver Traffic Safety Advisory Group. He was a member of the BC Coroner's uh, Teen Driver Death Review Panel. You wonder where he gets time to do any work at all. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, Jeff is principal investigator on several studies funded by the Canadian Institute of Health Research, including a recently completed study on the risk of crashing associated with cannabis use, and that's vehicle crashing, not the other crashing, and an evaluation of the effect of cannabis legalization, which is going to look at changes in the proportion of injured drivers who test positive for cannabis. So with that, I'll give you Dr. Brubaker. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, cannabis and motor vehicle crashes, just a quick overview of what we do know. Um, th these are the objectives, and really my main objective is that everybody walks away from here having learned something that they didn't know when they came in, and hopefully that includes me. Usually it includes me, depending on the questions and conversation that we have at the end, so please do ask questions. Um, I'm going to quickly um, start by talking about how we know that alcohol causes crashes. I think that's really informative. Um, it's sort of what we'd like to have with cannabis. I'm going to give you a quick overview of what cannabis impairment looks like. I'm going to summarize the literature quickly on cannabis and crash risk. I'm going to discuss briefly why cannabis is so hard to study and why we don't know as much about it as what we'd like. Then I'm going to talk about my project in British Columbia. Um, that we just completed, looking at the crash risk associated with cannabis. And then if we have time at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about some ideas for how cannabis and driving can be monitored and what are the pros and cons of that. And then I'm going to speculate about what's going to happen with legalization. So we all know that alcohol causes crashes. We've known this for a long time. In fact, the UK had laws against drunk driving of a horse and buggy uh, going back to 1872 before the vehicle, the cars were actually invented. But police to enforce this had to prove that the driver was drunk, which as we all know is, is difficult to do. Things changed in the 60s following the invention of this device. This is um, Robert Borkenstein, who was a police photographer. He invented the portable uh, breathalyzer. And here he is fiddling with one of the prototypes back in the 1950s. Well, this device let him go to the scene of crashes with police and measure alcohol at the side of the road. And he did that in a big study in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He went to around 6,000 crashes, tested the drivers for alcohol, and then he matched those with crashes at the same roads um, with drivers who hadn't been in a crash. And he compared 
alcohol use and drivers with alcohol use, drivers who had crashed with alcohol use and drivers who hadn't crashed. He calculated something called, called the odds ratio, which I have up there, but basically that gives you the likelihood of crashing for drivers who were drinking compared with drivers who weren't drinking. So I'm going to use the word odds ratio now and again. Basically, just think of it, if it's high, if it's five, for example, that means that drinking drivers are five times more likely to crash than non-drinking drivers. If it's one half, it means that they're half as likely. So this is the, the results of the Grand Rapids study. And what you see there is a nice curve that gives you the risk of crashing versus the alcohol level. And you see as the alcohol level goes up, as the BAC gets higher, the risk of crashing goes up. And it goes up exponentially at high levels. This is what we'd like to have with cannabis. And for the next of the talk, I'm going to make excuses why we're not there yet. Okay, let's start by talking a little bit about cannabis impairment. What does it look like? So our body makes compounds called endocannabinoids. They're cannabis-like things that act, there's receptors for them um, throughout the brain. They're, they're there to modulate our reaction to chronic stress. They play an important role. When you smoke cannabis, THC acts at those receptors and it inhibits the release of neurotransmitters, which is how our brain cells talk to one another. It, it sort of cools things down or slows things down. And clinically, that looks like we're probably, met, many of us are familiar either from uh, trying it yourself or from seeing other people or hearing about it, but euphoria, relaxation, people can become lethargic. Sometimes people get panic attacks, paranoia, when I work in the emergency department, this is about the only reason I see someone who uses cannabis. An overdose is a new user. Usually they took an edible and they were surprised by the effects. They got maybe more than what they thought they would because you can't titrate with an ed edible and they come in with a panic attack. Um, people who use cannabis have an altered time sense. Their internal clock is slowed down. Attention deficits is really prominent. They're easily distracted. They have difficulty focusing on a task. They have difficulty with divided attention, switching forward rapidly between two, tax, two tasks. They have problems with sustained attention. Um, they have slow information processing. Their reflexes are, are slowed down. Their reaction time is slowed. And their coordination is impaired. So this has been studied in drivers, and this is a nice study. This goes back maybe 15 years now, but Romikers, a fellow from the Netherlands, does this. It's impressive that he's able to do it, actually, but a study where you have two vehicles. The lead vehicle is driven by a professional driver. The following vehicle is a test candidate, a, stud, a subject who will smoke cannabis or, or a, a controlled, you know, a, a, a placebo and he gets behind the wheel with a driving instructor for safety and they drive for 100 kilometers through the streets of Netherlands and they monitor weaving, how far does a car go back and forth and how well do they maintain a constant headway, can they make, you know, match the speed of the lead car. And they found that people who use cannabis tend to weave more, their reactions are slowed like we mentioned and they have problems maintaining a constant speed. Just roughly speaking, the, the impairment that you see with the T, blood THC of around three is felt to be about the same as a BAC of 0.05%. And when you get up to five nanograms per mil for the THC, it's about the equivalent of a BAC of 0.08. But the type of impairment is different. And that's important. People who use alcohol tend to be more aggressive and take more risks. People who use cannabis are often quite aware of their impairment and they often compensate. They drive slower, they leave more headway, they don't do those risky maneuvers like a drunk driver will do. And so the question is, experimental evidence is great, what happens in the laboratory, but what happens in the real world? And what we really need is what we call epidemiologic evidence. And there's been a lot of studies done looking at this. This is a, a study from uh, 2012 by Mark Asbridge, a researcher out of Nova Scotia. He took um, selected high quality studies looking at the risk of cannabis and crashes and he combined the results from all of them. What he found overall is the risk 
is about double in drivers who use cannabis, an odds ratio of 1.92. If you look at just the best quality ones, the ones that I have in the little box there, the risk is about, one, the odds ratio is 1.65. So you could say that's a 65% increase in risk. So this would be considered in the scheme of things, remember those, this curve we had with alcohol, this would be considered a moderate increased risk. Now since that, that review came out, there have been several other, other studies looking at this. This is a big study from Europe, um, part of the, the Druid Driving Under the Influence of Drugs initiative. And it was a case control study. The cases were drivers who came to hospital after a crash and researchers would approach them and ask for blood work and measure their THC levels. The controls were drivers from a roadside survey. They were not matched to the same roads in the same time. They were from the same region, but they weren't matched the way it was done in the uh, Grand Rapids study. And the other problem with this study is that they used saliva in the controls. It's very hard to get someone to volunteer to give you a blood sample. It's easier to get a saliva sample. So for many of the controls, they, they use saliva instead of blood. This is what they found. They had quite a few crashes, almost 2,500 and about almost 16,000 controls. The refusal rate, which is important for all of these studies, for the, control, for the cases um, was relatively low, was up to 8%. For the controls though, in some cases, the, the refusal rate was as high as 50%, depending on the country. So when you have a high refusal rate, you have to ask yourself, are the drivers who use drugs more likely to refuse than the drivers who didn't? The answer is, you know, there's reason to think that they probably would be, especially when police are involved to, to pull them over to participate. So that's a potential source of bias with that study. So this is what they found. Now, again, the, the little dot is the odds ratio. The lines around it is the level of certainty. So the wider the lines, the less certain you are. And just uh, draw your attention to the scale on the bottom. It's semi-log, so as you go out further, it goes up to 80 times. The first thing that you notice is a huge increased risk with alcohol. You, if you study alcohol and you don't find an increased risk of crashing, you're doing something wrong. Every study of alcohol finds that. The one we want to pay attention to here is cannabis, and there you see there's about a doubling of the risk with cannabis. Okay, so that was that study. Now, this is another study that probably many of you have seen. It's the Virginia Beach study. Um, this study was a really ambitious, well-designed study. They tried to mimic uh, the Grand Rapids study. So basically, researchers went with police to the scene of crashes. They got oral fluid from drivers who'd been in a crash. And then a week later, they went back to the same place and they got controls, the same roads, the same time of day, and they got oral fluid from controls. So from that, it was a really resource intensive, well-designed, ambitious project. The problem, I just want to draw your attention to those numbers at the bottom, about 20% of cases refused to participate, refused to give oral fluid, and about 16% of controls. So again, a potential for bias there. This is what they found, and I think this really surprised everybody. So they did it right for alcohol, you see this increased risk. But for THC, for marijuana, that dot, that, that estimate of the, of the risk of crashing is right on one. There was not even a hint that things got worse in drivers who took cannabis. This is after they adjusted for alcohol and age and so forth. So what's going on there? Well, there are a couple of problems with the study that might explain that. One is the refusal rate that we talked about. The other is, by and large, these were minor crashes. Two-thirds of them were property damage only. So we know with alcohol anyways that the risk, the involvement of alcohol is higher in the major crashes than what it is in the minor crashes. So maybe that was the problem. And another problem, and we'll talk more about this in detail, is they used any level of THC in the saliva as positive. So even if it was just a trace detectable, um, they probably, as a result of doing that, included a lot of people who weren't impaired. People have also commented that Virginia Beach is near a military base. Everybody there is either in the military or works for an industry that supplies the military, and there's mandatory drug screening all over the place. So if you're going to use drugs, you're going to use drugs that might not show up 
on routine testing, some of the synthetic compounds that act like THC but don't get detected. So maybe that was, that's what was going on as well. At any rate, the study, I think it was really ambitious, but there were enough problems with it that people didn't really believe that there's no association at all. Um, more recently, another researcher, this is Rosberg out of Sweden, this is about a year and a half ago, did another systematic review. He counted things a little bit differently, and I don't quite agree with how he did it, but when he added it all up, he concluded that the risk of crashing with cannabis is about increased 36%, an odds ratio of 1.36. So you're seeing a small, a pause, I mean, statistically significant, but a small increased risk of crashing. This would be more or less the same as what you might get with a BAC between 0 and 0.05, small increased risk. More recently, this study came out of France. This was just about six months ago. So this was a culpability study, and I'm going to tell you what that means later when I talk about my own research, looking at fatal crashes. So the driver was involved in a crash that killed somebody. Either the driver was killed or somebody else. There's mandatory testing of all of these drivers in France. And what that study concluded, the, the, the top uh, circle there, is an odds ratio of 1.65 for the drivers who tested positive for cannabis. It's, it's interesting if you look at the numbers just above that, um, for cannabis THC between one and three, they got an odds ratio of 1.35. It went up between three and five, the odds ratio was up to 3.6. But when they got above five, it dropped off again. And I don't know what that means. Um, I don't know why they reported this without adjusting for alcohol, but that's what they did. This wasn't adjusted for alcohol. But they commented that if you excluded the cases that, like you only included the cases that were THC only, no alcohol at all, they got the same pattern. They seemed to see a decrease in risk for THC above five. And uh, I, I'm not sure what to make of that. So why are we having such a hard time uh, studying cannabis? We've, there have been dozens of studies tens of thousands of drivers studied, and the best we're able to say is it looks like probably cannabis increases the risk of crashing a little bit, but we don't have this risk curve that says at what level does the risk start to increase. Why is that? And I thought I'd just spend, I mean, basically I'm gonna spend the next few slides making excuses. Um, first of all, and, and you have to think of this when you read the literature as well, different studies use different body fluids. You can use saliva, you can use blood, you can use urine. Obviously, saliva is probably the easiest. Blood is probably really hard to get from people at the side of the road anyway, so there's reasons why you might pick one. But let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons of using those different fluids. So, uh, you know, I have this picture with a brain kind of at the front. Which you're, when you want to measure THC levels, you really want to know what's going on in the brain. And I just want to walk through what happens when you smoke cannabis. It's pretty obvious, but first of all, it passes through your mouth. And as that happens, some of the THC gets deposited in your oral cavity. It contaminates the oral cavity. Then from there, it goes on into the lungs. It rapidly absorbs from the lungs into the blood, same as nicotine when you smoke a cigarette. The blood carries a THC to the brain. It diffuses from the blood into the brain, and there's an equilibrium between the blood and the brain. So the THC in the blood is closely correlated with what's going on in the brain. Then THC gets stored in fat and it gets broken down to something called carboxy-THC that I have written there, C-O-O-H-T-H-C, and that gets excreted in the urine. So when you're measuring saliva THC, what you're measuring is contamination that got there from smoking. If you eat THC capsules, your saliva is going to be negative. And they've done this experimentally. So you're measuring contamination. The levels that you get is going to have, are going to be dependent on the concentration of the saliva, the volume of saliva, how you smoked, how much contamination you got as you were smoking. Is there blood or, you know, if you're after a crash, is there blood or something else in your mouth that might be contaminating it? It doesn't correlate with what's going on. It, it doesn't correlate it well with what's going on in the blood. There, of course, there's a rough correlation, but it doesn't correlate well. THC in the blood is good. Um, it, it's in equilibrium with the brain. The urine is measuring an inactive metabolite. 
And because uh, THC can hang around in the fat for so long, urine can stay positive for a long time, a month after last use in a heavy user. So just to quickly go over some of this, positive urine means you, mar you use marijuana sometime in the last month. That's basically what you can conclude from that. Positive THC, if you set that off at as low as detectable, in many people it'll be positive for two days or even longer. You can set a level in the saliva, 25 nanograms per mil, 50 nanograms per mil, and that's gonna make it more specific for recent use. Of course, the higher that level goes, the more likely you are to miss some cases as well. Um, but there's poor correlation with what's going on in the blood. Some researchers have looked at using other uh, cannabinoids in the saliva, so cannabidiol, cannabinol, other things that are in marijuana. If you measure those, you can make it a little bit more specific for recent use. But still, you're start, if you start you know, insisting on a certain minimal level of CBD, you're gonna start missing cases as well. So for the blood, we have to be honest with blood THC, I mean, by and large, it usually means if it's positive, there was recent use. But in a heavy user, it can stay positive for a week or longer at low levels. But once you get to a THC above two in the blood, again, there's a few exceptions, but, but usually that means acute use within the last four hours. And then, of course, as blood levels get higher, three, five, seven nanograms per mil, that's when you start to see impairment. And I, I, was, you know, I was puzzling to myself why in the research that we're doing we have such low THC levels compared to the THC levels that are reported in all the fat fatal cases. And I started looking into what happens to blood THC levels after death, so the kind of THC you get from the coroner. And the answer is it's complex. No one really knows for sure. You can, get, you can measure blood from the heart and from the femoral vein and you get different levels of THC in the same person, but probably the THC levels tend to go up after death. So the post-mortem THC that's reported from the coroner tends to be higher than what it probably was at the time of a crash. So we sort of talked about what happens a long time after using THC, why you can have false positives, cases that have been you know, more than four hours and the person's no longer impaired but it's still positive. But I think you have to look at the flip side of that, what happens immediately after. And in this graph, the red lines show the THC concentrations after you smoke. The blue lines are after you ingest an edible. And THC is rapidly absorbed as you're smoking, the levels peak quite quickly at usually over 100 nanograms per mil. And then because it, it's absorbed in the fat, the levels drop very quickly as well. So if someone's in a crash and they have a level of 60, they're maybe smoking in the car, and you get a blood level four hours later, it could come back at two or maybe one. And you don't know whether that THC level means that the person had a level of 60 at the time of the crash or whether it means they're a chronic user who has this chronic low level. You want to get your, if you're doing any testing with, t with uh, blood and THC, you want to get that blood test as soon as possible after the crash. The longer you wait, the harder it is to interpret. And then that blue line with edibles, I mean, that's a whole other, a whole other ballpark because, you know, there the peak, it depends on whether it was a really fatty, uh, you know, a, a hash brownie or whether it was some sort of infused beverage that's absorbed more rapidly. Um, the timing there is, is also very difficult to interpret. But the sooner after the crash that you get the blood, the better. And we talked a little bit about which comparison group. Ideally, you would study drivers who are on the same roads at the same time. That's, that's the Grand Rapids, that's the, all the big alcohol studies have been able to do that. That's really difficult to do. And people have made compromises, they've used roadside surveys from the same region like that study from Europe that I showed you. I've seen one study that looked at drivers in a gas station and they just used them as their control population. But if you're pumping, if you're stoned, are you gonna go buy gas? I mean, I don't think so, probably. 
I've seen people who've used emergency department patients who come in for a heart attack or pneumonia, but there's no reason to think that that population has anything to do with what drivers on the road are using. So when you're reading this literature, you have to look at what comparison group did they use? Did it make sense? And you have to look, did they test for THC, for cannabis, in the comparison group the same way they tested it in the case group, in the drivers that were actually in a crash? And in some cases, they didn't do that. What outcomes are we interested in? We talked about the, Grand Ra the uh, Virginia Beach study that mostly studied fender benders. When you're comparing, they're, they're, the association with drugs with fender benders might be very different than the association with serious injuries or fatal crashes. So you have to ask yourself, what, what, what is the population of drivers that we're studying? You have to be open to the possibility that the answer might be different for just fender benders than for the, the serious injury crashes. Maybe drug involvement is higher or lower in the serious injury crashes. And then the last thing that complicates this is other risk factors. This is a sort of a Venn diagram. It, it shows the prevalence of different drugs that we found in our injured drivers that were studied in British Columbia. And you can see the overlaps. The, the bottom line here is that people who use cannabis are more likely to also be drinking than people who didn't use cannabis. And if you're gonna be studying this, you can't study cannabis in isolation. You have to consider alcohol, you have to consider other drugs. And you have to consider things like the people who use cannabis are typically young males. Young males are a whole other breed, as we all know. They look at, I, I mean, I, I'm the father of one. They look at risk very differently than, you know, when our brains get a little bit more mature. And, and these are the people who get into crashes. Maybe they're just gonna be at higher risk of crashing regardless of whether they use pot. So you have to look at the age you have to look at the gender. You at least have to look at alcohol. And if you don't, if, the, if you read a study that didn't adjust for those things, just, just turn the page and, and go on to the next one. You're wasting your time. You have to adjust for that. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk, uh, with, with that background, I'm gonna talk quickly about a study that we're doing in British Columbia. Actually, we've completed it. Cannabis and Motor Vehicle Crashes, a multi-center culpability study. Um, I'd like to give special recognition to two of my team members, they're not here, but Herb Chan, who's an epidemiologist who's helped me with study design and he's been working with me for almost 10 years, and Shannon Erdeli, who's the, the stats guru, who if she was here would be keeping me honest about my explanation for odds ratios and the like. Uh, these are the people that make me look uh, smarter than what I am. So the study was funded by the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, and as Sam mentioned, I myself am funded by the Michael Smith Foundation. It gives me some protected time to do my research. Um, I don't have any conflict of interest or commercial affiliation. I didn't invest in medical marijuana stock, although maybe I wish I had. <laughs> um, but Okay, so this is a culpability study. What's a culpability study? This is a study where everyone in the study was in a crash. And instead of comparing drivers who were in a crash with drivers who weren't, we're comparing, we're comparing THC use in drivers who caused the crash versus drivers who were innocently involved. If you're driving on a clear road, good road conditions, good visibility, and you lose control and you crash your car, you're responsible, you're a case. If you're stopped in traffic making a legal turn, and someone rear ends you, you were sort of selected at random to participate in the study. You're a control. That's how it works. And the way we do this, we have a system for scoring the police reports in British Columbia. We look at all the factors that could cause a crash. And I should make it clear, this isn't, we, we use the word culpability, because this is not legal culpability. This isn't you're gonna be charged with something. This sort of comes by the paradigm of a normal driver, a good driver, should, should he have been able to avoid the crash in this situation? So you look at the road, you give it a score, you look at the driving conditions, the vehicle conditions, the weather, and if there's a bunch of things that contributed to the crash, you get a high score and you're not culpable. But if there's nothing that, but if everything gets a low score, then the only explanation for the crash is the guy behind the wheel of the car 
and you're culpable. So we, it, we do this, we have this automatic, it's done electronically, so we're entirely blinded to um, whether the person used drugs, whether the person used alcohol, anything that's in the police report, it's all done electronically, which we think is an advantage. Studies run, it, it's been in, in seven trauma centers in British Columbia, but the vast majority of cases come from these four big trauma centers. Uh, so just a quick review of BC geography. The way it works is every driver who comes through the hospital, uh, driver of a car or light truck, who's seriously injured enough that someone for medical reasons decides that they need blood work, and blood work is taken within six hours of the crash, um, they're eligible to participate. So these are typically drivers who are brought from the scene of the crash by ambulance. When these people arrive, there's a a lot of commotion in the hospital, especially if they're seriously injured. This is a picture of a trauma team there. And one of the first things that we do is we start intravenous access and so forth is we take blood work. So we tend to get that pretty quickly. I had optimistically thought we were gonna get all, all our blood within 60 minutes, but some of these come from a distance and it's a little bit longer. So we're aiming for maybe a little bit more like 90 minutes. We didn't even quite achieve that, but it certainly better than the forensic cases where you get blood through the legal system where there's a more cumbersome process and in those studies it's been more like three or four hours. So we did a little bit better. So we scan the census every day. Who, who visited the emergency department? Here's a driver, he had blood work. Research assistant goes up to the laboratory. They take a little bit of blood that's left over because there's usually a little bit of blood left over. They relabel it with a study ID number, they freeze it and it gets analyzed at the Provincial Toxicology Center. And then we get the police reports that we score with our culpability scoring system. So this is what we found. Over the course of the study, there were about 3,000 drivers who were eligible that had excess blood. We linked um, 2,300 of them to police reports and we scored those. About 500 had indeterminate culpability. So they were kind of in this gray area. The, the score was too high for them to be a, a, a control and too low for, uh, it, it, was, it was in the gray area. I'm, I'm gonna get muddled if I try to explain it. But it was in the gray area. We couldn't definitively assign culpability. We wanted things black and white. So we excluded those from the analysis. We had those 1,825 that culpability was definitively assigned and about 65% of those were culpable. So it's a little bit, we, we call this a harsh scale. We, want to, we don't want to give people the benefit of the doubt. If they think they should have been able to avoid the crash, then they're culpable. This is what our population looked like. The mean age was 44. About two thirds of our drivers were male. About a third were single vehicle crashes. And a bit over a third were nighttime crashes and then SVNC, single vehicle nighttime crash, is about 17%. Just over a quarter of those were admitted. So in the scheme of things, like if you read a statistics report, a serious injury crash is one that was admitted to hospital. So all of these had some injury. There was something about the crash that made the, 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 the clinical team decide to take blood work, but only a quarter of them were seriously injured. So that's, that's our population. And then in terms of the, the time from crash to blood draw, the mean time was 101 minutes. So a little bit worse than what we'd hoped, but not too bad. We got two thirds of the cases within two hours. So a quarter within 60 minutes and half between 60 and 120 minutes. Not too bad. Here's the toxicology results. So if we start at the far end, um, any drug or alcohol, 40% of drivers tested positive for some impairing substance. The most common single substance was still alcohol. We had 13% with a BAC above 0.08. And just as a comment, you know, we, we've been doing this research with alcohol for some time, and if you go back a decade or more, those numbers would be more like 35%. We've done a lot better in British Columbia with immediate roadside prohibitions but still a lot of alcohol. And then the next, the middle section there is the cannabis. So the first carboxy THC, 17%. These are the cannabis users, not necessarily impaired, but people who in the last couple of days or couple of weeks smoke cannabis. 
17%. THC greater than zero is 9%. So these are, many of these are gonna be recent use. Some might be though a couple of days ago. THC above two, this is recent use, 4.8%. And THC above five, this is in the impairment range for sure, 1.1%. So relatively small numbers at the higher THC levels. And these are our risk estimates. So for THC between zero and two, really no risk. It was 1.1 was the odds ratio, crosses the, 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 the dotted line, um, no statistically significant and really not even, I mean 1.1 is just small. For THC between two and five, it was one and a quarter was the odds ratio, again not statistically significant. When you got up to higher THC, now there were only 20 cases with a, with a THC above five. Shannon would hit me if I said this, but it's trying to be statistically significant. It's not quite, but the odds ratio is 1.8. Okay, and then for alcohol, of course, uh, we, we have these high odds ratios. I should go back. Um, just to comment, other recreational drugs, so there we're talking uh, amphetamines, cocaine, there we did get a statistically significant um, effect. And for impairing medications, benzodiazepines, antidepressants, a statistically significant effect. And I just wanted to comment on what happens at higher THC levels. These are just the crude numbers, but just to show you those bar graphs, when THC is above 10, we only had eight cases there, but seven of them were culpable. So we're hoping, we're actually extending this study for another five years, um, mostly to look at the effects of legalization, but we're gonna continue this as well, and hopefully, maybe I shouldn't say that, but for scientific reasons, hopefully we'll get more cases with higher THC levels and we'll be able to uh, improve these estimates a little bit. So these are, these are our conclusions. Little evidence that drivers with THC less than five have increased crash risk. At higher levels, it's likely associated with increased risk. Certainly the literature suggests that. Other recreational drugs and impairing medications do increase the crash risk. And I think this last one's really important. Alcohol remains our biggest problem. We just cannot lose sight of alcohol. It's still our single biggest problem. And you know, with all the attention to cannabis, cannabis legalization, let's not lose track of where the real problem lies, which is, which is with alcohol. Okay, how am I doing for time there, Sam, do you know? 10 minutes. Okay, okay, good, yeah, good. So I wanna spend the, the next section just talking quickly about how we can monitor cannabis use, and I'm gonna just go over the, the different options that are out there and some of the pros and cons of each. So one is roadside surveys, and these have a couple of big advantages. That, that Really, it, it's quick. You can get a lot of samples in a short period of time, and you can sort of sample wherever you want geographically. So that's the advantage. There are a few disadvantages that you just have to be aware of when you interpret. One is refusals. You know, that 20% refusal rate probably skews the numbers. Now, if you look at the roadside surveys, they have significant numbers of drivers who test positive, so you know that not all the drivers who use drugs are refusing, but you kind of wonder whether the numbers are a little bit higher than what they're getting because of that refusal rate. The other problem is their use of saliva. At a population level, statistically, you can say if you have a high level of drug in the saliva, high level of THC in the saliva, you likely have it in the blood. But still, it doesn't, the saliva THC level doesn't correlate well with impairment, doesn't correlate well with blood levels. It would be better if they could do this with blood, but for obvious reasons, they can't. And then there's some minor problems. The cost is, is, you know, you have to pay for each sample to be analyzed. It's not cheap. It doesn't work well for continuous monitoring. You can't set up a place and just keep on sampling drivers as they come by. People will avoid it or, you know, it's just not gonna work. And of course, you're studying drivers who haven't been in a crash. You're really interested in the c contribution of crashes. I think we need to include roadside surveys in our monitoring, but you have to be aware of, of their limitations. So coroner series, um, the big advantage I guess for this is, and I didn't put it down here, is that this is 
uh, data that's coming to us anyways. Coroners usually, in many places, routinely as part of their investigation, test drivers for drugs. So the, the data is coming to us. It uses blood, and you know, despite the problems with postmortem changes that I mentioned before, that's probably that's still the best uh, sample. And it's a relevant part. I mean, these are people who are killed after a crash, so you really want to know what's going on at the at the top of the pyramid if you're from the public health perspective. The difficulty is there's not a lot of cases. Um, you know, fortunately, we we don't have tons of, of people coming. Uh, fatally injured in crashes, we have enough, we have too many, but for statistical reasons, there's not, that there's not that many. And in some places, the coroners only sample cases that they think use drugs, that's called selection bias. So that can be a problem depending on the practice of the coroner. Ideally, you'd have uh, protocols where everybody who's killed in a crash gets tested. That's not always the case. Please crash reports would intuitively be a great source of information. Every time you know, police file a report, they, they have the option to say that they think drugs contributed to the crash. The problem with this is police have a hard time recognizing drivers who use cannabis. And I thought I'd just show you, this is some results from the, this, the research we're doing in BC where we compared drug testing, where we actually measured THC levels with what was in the police report. And what you can see on the TH, you know, please suspect drugs for THC between zero and two, 3.3 percent of the reports had some evidence that the police thought drugs were involved. It went up, but not much for THC between two and five, and THC greater than five, but still we're talking eight, nine percent at the most. And that little um, one at the very bottom, THC greater than zero with an asterisk, those are the cases that it was THC only, no alcohol, no other drugs. There were 68 of those. In not one of those reports did the police think that drugs were involved. So I wouldn't recommend, oh, I should just mention, I have human factors. So if you look at how often police thought that something was wrong with the driver that caused the crash, that does go up with THC level. THC above five, 50 percent of the time, the police thought there's something wrong with the driver. They were distracted or something like that. So they know there's something wrong, but it, it's just really hard to, to detect drugs that in, in, in drivers who've been in a crash. And I don't fault the police. I mean, I, I, I work in the emergency department. I see these drivers all the time, and I don't think I would do a whole lot better, quite honestly. The point is that I don't think police reports are going to be a reliable way of monitoring what's happening with drug impaired driving. And then, of course, my uh, pet project is studying injured drivers. And I think, you know, using similar methods to what we're doing in British Columbia, and I think there's a lot of advantages to doing this. You're studying a relevant population, they've been in a crash, you're using blood, and the timing. You can usually get blood pretty quickly after the crash, within a couple of hours in most cases. You get more numbers than you do with the coroner, so it's better for statistical testing. And you know, in my ideal world, somewhere down the line, trauma centers are going to adopt this for what they do routinely, the way we now do for alcohol. Someone comes in after a crash, in most trauma centers in Canada, alcohol is going to be measured as just part of routine care because it's a teaching opportunity. It's a chance to counsel somebody about drinking. Um, ideally, that would become part of routine clinical care with, with, with drugs as well. There's some drawbacks. The cost, it's quite expensive, more expensive than the roadside survey. The logistics of getting this set up is, is difficult, and it doesn't work in small centers. You really need a hospital that sees a lot of cases to have the the resources to continuously scan the charts in a hospital that sees a case a month. It just doesn't, just doesn't make sense. So those are the pros and cons. We're doing this in British Columbia, like I told you. Just recently this year, um, we launched in uh, three other provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and in Ontario with funding from those provincial governments. And we're hoping to expand to other sites across Canada. I have a, an application in with Health Canada, so if any of you have any uh, pull there, let me let, let them know. Um, ideally, we'd be collecting this from hospitals across the country. But I think that a, that a good um, monitoring system for drugs would include a combination of injured drivers, coroners' cases, and strategic roadside surveys. 
Okay, for the last few minutes, I'm going to speculate about what's gonna happen with legalization. So as you all know, cannabis is due to be legalized soon. Um, and along with that, there's been some regulations proposed with per se levels that, that may be introduced as well. We know looking at other places that there have been reports of things getting a lot worse after cannabis was legalized. This is a study out of, so in Washington, um, cannabis was legalized in December 2012 and they introduced a per se limit along with that. They did a fairly good study reporting a 50% increase in the prevalence of THC in drivers involved in fatal crashes. So this is a, this is a graph and it shows the drivers with, so these are drivers who they, they it was, it, so basically it was THC, not carboxy THC, which is the point I wanted to make. Um, this is any THC. They also commented that the drivers with THC above five, the numbers were about 50% of the drivers who tested THC positive, but it followed a, a sim similar pattern. So basically, the number of drivers who used THC, the number of drivers with high THC levels went up after legalization. One big problem with this study is that in many cases, THC wasn't measured, and they used this statistical black magic called imputation to estimate what they thought the THC level was going to be based on other factors. And that's okay if you do that for 10% or 5% of cases, but I think they had to do it in something like 50%. It was huge, the number of cases that they didn't actually have the levels. And that makes me just a little nervous. But nevertheless, the results are pretty compelling that things, the number of drivers who tested positive for THC went up following legalization. This is a report out of Colorado. So they legalized marijuana in November 2013. They also introduced a per se limit. And they reported this astonishing 92% increase in cannabis related traffic deaths between 2010 and 2014. That's what they said. Well, here's the data. Um, first of all, cannabis related meant you tested positive for carboxy THC or THC. So in other words, it didn't really have anything to do with impairment. They didn't have THC levels like in Washington State. And second, if you look at that graph, th there's, you know, it, there's an obvious trend. It's increasing and it was increasing long before legalization came into effect. And I have a hard time saying that legalization had anything to do with the increase between 2010 and 2014. That trend was there already. So, you know, it's overstated a little bit. Um, people were looking into why was, was the numbers going up in Colorado, and there's this nice study that looked at the number, sort of the availability of cannabis. And they looked at the number of medical marijuana users um, in Colorado, and that graph on your, I always get right and left mixed up, on your left, the one that says the number of registered mar medical marijuana users, you can see this increase starting pretty dramatically in the summer of 2009. Then the second graph, now the, the time scale is different, but I, I put a vertical line where 2009 is. You can see the prevalent, the number of drivers tested positive for cannabis. And those numbers seem to parallel the increase. So probably, what these, what these researchers are saying that is that it was the availability of medical marijuana that led to that increase. Maybe it was more availability than it was legalization. And then for, I, I know this probably isn't the same clear across the country, but certainly walking around my workplace, you know, in downtown Vancouver, you can't go far before you bump into a cannabis dispensary. Therefore, medical marijuana, medical marijuana is the way I, I would put it. Um, you know, one of the notes there says, uh, doctors, no doctor's note for pot, no problem. As far as I understand it, you can walk into one of these dispensaries and say, I can't sleep, I'm feeling a little anxious, and they'll say, take this, and you're a medical marijuana user. The, the, the red line with the graph, it shows a number of cannabis dispensaries in Vancouver, and you see that just shot up um, dramatically in the past couple of years. Now actually, City of Vancouver is regulating these. They, they, um, they actually closed down a few of them so the numbers are a little bit smaller. But the ones that remain are 
many cases quite slick and professional. There's one near the hospital where I work, and it looks like they're selling, it looks like a gift shop. I mean, it's this beautiful corner, uh, corner building, lots of glass. It looks fancy inside. It's like, wow. Um, so, it's, so medical marijuana, marijuana in general, in British Columbia at least, is already very available. I'm not sure that it's going to become more available after legalization. It might, but we don't know. Maybe that is already saturated. Hard to say. Another interesting study that came out, and this is uh, 2013 as well, Journal of Law and Economics, and what they did is they looked at uh, crashes, all-cause fatalities for motor vehicle of, in states that legalized medical marijuana. And they compared that with states that didn't. And what they found was a decrease, 8 to 11 percent decrease in fatal crashes following legalization. What they speculated is going on is something called substitution, where people, instead of using alcohol, use marijuana. And if you smoke pot, your risk isn't as high as it is if you drink. And maybe your desire to drive a car isn't as high either, and you just stay at home. So they speculated that maybe people were substituting and that roads got a little bit safer as a result. Now, the flip side of that is we're talking about, that was talking about medical marijuana. Here in Canada, we're talking about recreational marijuana. And we all know that if you combine alcohol with pot, the effects are additive. Your risk of crashing goes up a lot higher when you have both of them on board. Your ability to compensate um, goes down. And here's an interesting tidbit that I found when I was researching that. When you drink alcohol, your blood vessels dilate. We, we know that medically. It includes the blood vessels in your lungs. If you then smoke pot, you're, you absorb more. You get higher THC levels. So if you drink and smoke pot, you get higher THC levels. Interestingly, if you do it the other way around, it, it, obviously it doesn't happen. You might even get lower alcohol levels. So if you're going to mix the two, I think you, never mind, I won't, I, <laughs> I won't go there. I won't go there. Um, but, but certainly this is a potential huge problem. If you get people mixing alcohol and cannabis, um, it, it could be really bad. So as this is my second, well, this is my last slide, basically. Um, I'm speculating. I think I covered all my bases. Things might get better. Things might get worse. Things might stay the same. Uh, we really don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Okay. Can I just go up here? Or, yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I'll, I'll man this mic. So, any questions, folks, for Dr. Brubaker? My name is Marie Kumat. I'm with Progressive Flight Solutions. And I have a, a question that's based on a documentary that I saw on, on TV. I think it was done by CBC. And they didn't just talk about THC. They talked about another compound that's in marijuana. Could you explain or, or how did that enter into your study or did it? So, I guess, yeah. So, so there's probably about 100 uh, different uh, compounds found in cannabis. Okay. THC is the, is the major ingredient, and that's the one that we quantified. Uh, some of the other ones, like uh, cannabidiol, there's um, thinking that it might be useful for medical purposes. It actually doesn't cause impairment the way THC does. Um, we didn't measure that in our study. There, there's one compound that they said that actually reduces the effect of the THC on the body. That's the one I'm talking about. That's probably the cannabidiol. Hi, Charlie Clower from Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. Um, so you said in the Virginia Beach study that um, they measured presence only, really, of cannabis, yeah. but um, that it would have been better if they had also assessed impairment. How would how how should how should that be done? How should impairment be assessed in that in that in that space? Yeah. I mean, in an ideal world, you'd have someone go to the scene of crashes and get blood tests done, and you'd look at quantified levels <clears throat> that correlate with impairment. That would be the ideal study. For obvious reasons, that's really difficult to do. Um, 
it's difficult, I think, if you're going to use saliva, it's just difficult in general because you don't have a good correlation with impairment or with, with uh, blood levels. Um, I don't think there's a simple answer. Yeah. What about performance testing? Yeah, I mean, performance testing is great. It's hard to do that after a crash of someone who might be injured. Yeah. The controls? Yeah, if you can get controls to volunteer for that. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so just to wrap here, um, thank you for your participation. Uh, if you've downloaded the app for this meeting, we'd invite you to go to the app and rate the meeting. Um, we are videotaping these sessions, so they will be available on the uh, CCMTA YouTube channel somewhat sometime in the near future. And we're gonna break for coffee, uh, back to the exhibit hall for people if you want. Uh, and. Um, the, uh, there's two other sessions this afternoon, so we invite you to attend those as well. And before you go, I'd just uh, like to make a little presentation here to Jeff on behalf of the CCMTA. I would just like to tell Jeff that we are very glad that you live and work in BC, but I tell you what, he scares me with what he tells me because, you know, you look at this and you think it's coming and we don't have an answer for it, really. Uh, you know, we're just second guessing it uh, at the effects of cannabis and how we're going to deal with it. So we need you, Jeff. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.